Welcome to this Rhodes Centre and Naval War College joint event. I'm delighted to host this today. My name is Mark Blythe. I'm the Director of the Rhodes Centre for International Economics and Finance here at Brown University. So this is a kickoff event for a public event, rather the public part of a joint Watson Naval War College uh, research workshop. And that research workshop is on what economic warfare in the 21st century might look like. Uh, we're delighted to partner with the Naval War Colleges on this event and hope that this is the first of many such events over the next several years. For inspiration in investigating this question, we look to historians who have studied the struggle between the United Kingdom and Germany over 100 years ago, when the United Kingdom, rather than the US, was at the core of the global financial system. We take up that challenge next week for the first of three sessions, discussing the past, the present, and the likely future. This first session is, if you will, the appetizer to that main course. One person who has thought more than most, at least that I know, about the interaction of the economic and the strategic is Jonathan Kirshner. He is Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Boston College. He is also simultaneously the Stephen and Barbara Friedman Professor of International Political Economy Emeritus in the Department of Government at Cornell University, thereby being the first Emeritus Professor I've ever met who is actually still working, but nonetheless we'll put that to one side. He is a founding co-editor of the Cornell series in Money and is the author of three very important books, American Power After the Financial Crisis from 2014, Appeasing the Bankers, Financial Caution on the Road to War from 2007, and Currency and Coercion, The Political Economy of International Monetary Power from 1995. And of course, I must mention what's probably his own favorite book, Cornell University Press 2012, Hollywood's Last Golden Age, Politics, Society, and the 70s Film in America. Jonathan will talk to us today about why early 20th century France may have alarming parallels for the US in the early 21st century. Jonathan will talk for about 35 minutes and then we will open to Q&A. A note on logistics for today. For those on Zoom, internal to Brown or with a Brown invite, please put your questions in the Q&A box. For those watching on YouTube, please put your question in the comment section and we can pick them up from there. To maximize our time to together, I will read them directly to Jonathan rather than have people coming on and off mute. And with that, over to you, Professor Kushner. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks for that very generous introduction. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate uh, or kick off this uh, conference, which I'm, I really look forward to, uh, to the following sessions. Um, this is a, an important and obviously timely topic. And in these uh, comments today, what I'm going to do is three things. The first, I want to make some brief framing comments on economic warfare and focus on this theme of my talk today, the kind of at home uh, component, which really is about uh, the domestic social economy. And I want to talk in particular about its consequences uh, of this for uh, the contemporary United States and a theoretical issue about the difference between a country's raw material power and its actual political capacity. Um, and an, I think an excellent illustration of this is interwar France. So I'm going to spend the bulk of my talk there and then bend back toward uh, the contemporary US applying some of those parallels and lessons. So to begin again, the theme is economic warfare begins at home. And I want to start with the observation that assessments of the prospects for economic statecraft typically focus on kind of bread and butter things on the apparent material capabilities of those who would practice it, the levers that a state would draw upon and their potential coercive power in a political sense, of course, that is, the economic measures have effects and those effects do or do not bring about desired political outcomes. Nevertheless, um, and this is true of my own research as well over the years, I think less attention has been paid to what I would describe as a crucial permissive factor in all this, uh, the robustness of the domestic social economy of a state contemplating the practice of economic coercion. And my argument is that domestic disaffection is the leaky bucket that can prevent underlying power. You can't really see me, I'm doing visuals with my hands but you can't see them on Zoom. Uh, the leaky bucket that can prevent underlying power from being effectively mobilized for 
political purpose. And again, what I want to elaborate is how well the case of interwar France well illustrates this. Uh, consider that by the late 1920s, France had Europe's most powerful army. Uh, it had much of the world's gold, and it was an active and aggressive practitioner of economic warfare, often successfully so. Uh, but within a decade, uh, tragically, and I'm going to go so far as to say even shamefully, uh, France could barely be roused to its own self-defense. Uh, that's a striking difference, a stark difference between 1930 and 1940, which I would argue can only be attributed to domestic factors within France. That is, to a radical polarization within French society and politics, and in the country, what one scholar called an embrace of the age of unreason, and that these things paralyzed the country's foreign policy practice more than its kind of material capabilities. And this is especially, I think, a valuable insight for abstract theory, but also uh, in a more downcast way. I think it is also relevant today because I think we can see a similar domestic desiccation uh, observable in the United States. And so as we think broadly over the next few weeks about economic statecraft or economic warfare and any type of practice that the Americans might contemplate in this regard, the prospects for such measures, especially if they will involve costs, um, must address the rate limiting factor of whether the domestic polity will permit the skillful and sustained and consequential practice of economic warfare. And what we're talking about here, for lack of a better term, are questions of the social economy, um, which I argue uh, can be important and in some cases definitive in explaining the outcome of confrontations between states. And again, my main takeaway here is that there will often be a crucial disjuncture between the raw material capabilities of a given state and its ability to quote unquote, actualize that power to effectively mobilize its underlying resources to advance foreign policy objectives. Now, it's important to acknowledge uh, that this kind of thing is not easy to measure, um, but that's, that's no excuse for not dwelling on it if it is crucial in explaining uh, state capacity on the world stage. And again, by the second decade of the 21st century, I see a difference between colossal American material power and its ability to harness and channel that power in the service of foreign policy goals. As always in these stories, history matters. This is a more general IR point, but I want to underscore it. It is impossible to understand where the US is going without understanding where it has been. And the, where it has been is a long journey of four decades of unraveling of its social cohesion. And again, that's the theme, that's the takeaway uh, of these comments uh, today. Now, having been a little self-critical of my own work uh, that I have failed to attend to this phenomenon adequately, let me nevertheless uh, quote a bushy-eyed young scholar from 1998 who said the following thing, quote, the single greatest security threat to the United States is the internal atrophy of its national vitality. Its growing inequality could intensify distributional conflicts and make it more difficult for it to pursue far-sighted national goals. So at least I put down a marker a couple of decades ago regarding these themes more generally. And I do think that this has in fact come sort of full flower, that increased inequality sustained and accumulating over four decades, I would argue is a defining characteristic of the contemporary American political economy. Now, we always want to be cautious here because it is not possible, and I mean that firmly, not possible to draw straight lines, theoretically or analytically, from income inequality to state power, or draw easily generalizable conclusions about it. Uh, perceptions of inequality matter, cultural norms about fairness matter, assessments of actors about opportunities, their absolute well-being, and their life prospects matter. Nevertheless, 
the long-term secular stagnation of median household incomes and a dramatic increase in wealth for those at the very top characterize the American economy and will have social consequences that will inform debates, fundamental debates about the very interpretation of the national interest and following from that, which foreign policy choices are best suited for or even appropriate to pursue those interests and what sacrifices make sense and by whom uh, should they be made. And I think this is especially important because globalization in the, con the broader context of globalization is not unrelated to these phenomena. And as with all economic processes, globalization generated, generates and has generated winners and losers. And in the American context, those have exacerbated these outcomes. And once again, my other uh, go-to saw here is that history matters. And the history that matters here are resentments about the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008. Actually, not so much the crisis as its aftermath, the divergent experiences that followed in its wake in which those who perpetuate or brought us the crisis uh, and the wealthy more generally did just fine, whereas the large majority of the country got the servings of the Great Recession. And this in turn, I think, has fueled a reemergence uh, of a certain type of politics within America, as well as more isolationist instincts, and that these have contributed more generally to a broader dysfunction in American domestic politics that I think are plainly visible. Uh, in some, it is simply not possible to understand foreign policy and foreign economic policy capabilities and the behavior of the US without taking into account its domestic political economy. Again, I think this, these arguments are exceptionally well illustrated by the experience of interwar France, and I want to spend a little time talking about that. Um, the stunning collapse of French power, and I think that's the appropriate word to use, uh, the formidable military machine that was associated with France quickly gave way to defeat, surrender, humiliation, and relatively docile occupation. This is a continuing puzzle. Narrowly materialist conceptions must attribute the entire catastrophe to a highly contestable argument about innovative German military tactics. But even that would not account for the character uh, of the submission and collaboration that followed in the wake of the defeat. This can only be understood in the context of France in the 30s, which was a deeply damaged, traumatized, and divided society. Once again, of course, history matters. And so we acknowledge that it is impossible to understand interwar France in general without attending to the trauma of the First World War and its profound uh, economic and social consequences on that society. Nevertheless, even in that context, if you just look at the second half of the 1920s, things are looking pretty good in material terms. France's position assessed in these material terms was exceptionally secure and its economic growth was extremely good. This is a very fine uh, kind of half decade of French history. And of interest to this group in the late 1920s, as you all know, France was also a very active, well-positioned and capable player in the realm of economic statecraft. Especially in Eastern Europe, especially on the financial side, France could plausibly envision itself as the dominant economic player on the continent and felt free to uh, essentially elbow aside all rivals. The confidence of France and its economic capabilities and in its position on the continent was such that in 1928, uh, Bank of France Governor Emile Moreau could write in his diary that he was going to the UK to offer the British war or peace, meaning over the issue of financial supremacy on the continent more generally. My point is simply that France is looking extraordinarily capable and confident as we come to the turn of the 1930s, not a long trip from there again to 1940. 
Regarding France's economic diplomacy, however, I do want to make two, I want to call attention to two lessons, one tactical, one profound. My, most of my comments are about the profound bit, um, but I do want to make this tactical observation because it's also interesting for students of economic diplomacy, which is that France's economic diplomacy ultimately overreached and backfired. Uh, maybe we can fight about this in Q&A, but I would argue firmly and confidently that France's economic warfare contributed to and exacerbated the global financial crisis of 1931, and that in turn contributed to the reduction of France's capacity to practice economic warfare on the continent and contributed to, ra contributed to radicalization and the rise of the Nazis in Germany. So again, uh, you can, you can have economic diplomacy that looks like it's doing really well, but nevertheless, it can still overreach and backfire. And that is, I think, a timely lesson for those contemplating the practice of economic diplomacy today. However, my bigger point is even more important. We look at France in the 1930s, top of the world, dominant military, uh, strive the continent, economic power, uh, and yet um, this was less consequential. This was not what was going on in France, it's not what mattered, which was the story of its underlying domestic social political unraveling. And even in the kind of glory days uh, of the late 1920s, uh, there was masked a profound social discontent and dysfunction with deep divisions in French society that were further exacerbated by the Great Depression. Now, the Great Depression was somewhat less severe in France than elsewhere, but it was still difficult and it lingered longer due to a misguided fetish uh, for economic orthodoxy, a hat tip to today's host, Mark Leith, who has written extensively about this. Uh, that economic orthodoxy, when necessary, was ultimately enforced by France's moneyed classes which in turn controlled the Bank of France. And collectively, these actors could bring down governments by withholding financial support or unleashing irresistible cascades of capital flight. And in these years, politics in France was such that bringing down left-leaning governments was perhaps the singular focus of the country's conservative actors, even at the expense of what a objective outsider might describe as the country's national interest. This, of course, as we all know, was not a story that ended well. Uh, France's failure to meet the German challenge, a failure to France's very existence, was a function of its internal disorder and atrophy. Again, perhaps I'm uh, belaboring the point, but accounts that don't consider factors like these simply cannot explain the often bizarre and self-defeating strategic and foreign policy choices made by France in the 1930s, rooted as they were in competing social visions, specious economic ideologies, and deep-seated political conflicts. For Raymond Aron, who was there, it was a deeply troubling time, as he described Basically, France didn't exist anymore. It existed only in the hatred of the French for each other. A jarring uh, but common characterization of subsequent analytical accounts as well. For Aron, the result was, especially after 1934, uh, quote, an exacerbation of social conflicts, a strengthening of the revolutionary parties of right and left, and a paralysis of government. Okay, and this is the story of France in this decade, even thinking about its international position, is my claim. The right was reactionary and in many quarters, frankly, undemocratic. The left offered kind of a bold, if vaguely specified vision of a new and different, and let's call it utopian France. Um, more important is that both sides saw the world through the lens of this basic domestic conflict, though, to be fair, throughout the 1930s, it was the reactionary right more than the impractical left that drove the choices that led the country to disaster. Uh, as scholars, we know that retrospective analyses have the advantage of sober detachment and access to information unavailable to participants in the moment, 
But to really capture the mood of what's going on, I do think eyewitness accounts of people who were there are of enormous value, and we have many of them. Uh, most of you are familiar uh, with foreign correspondent William Shire, but he wrote in 1925, France was, quote, the greatest power on the continent. But what happened in the years that followed? He watched with increasing apprehension as a third republic, quote, saw its strength gradually sapped by dissension and division, by incomprehensible blindness in foreign, domestic, and military policy, by the ineptness of its leaders, the corruption of its press, and a feeling of growing confusion, hopelessness, and cynicism of its people. These were not uncommon estimations of the situation in France. Edmund Taylor, the head of the Chicago Tribune's Paris Bureau, uh, saw things similarly. And when war finally came, he described it this way. The, ma the vast majority of the French answered the call to arms like somnambulists, um, as if stricken by symptoms of a political malady characterized by apathy, absence of enthusiasm, and uncertainty of aim in a period that he says witnessed the ideological collapse of French democracy. No small thing, especially when we start to think ahead about how this might be relevant uh, for contemporary international politics. So it took six weeks for France to fall militarily, but the fall of France was at least six years, not six weeks in the making. Long simmering tensions in France uh, explode on the streets of Paris in 1934 after two years of a series of centrist governments uh, struggling to guide the country through the early years of the Great Depression. Efforts we should mention that were routinely undercut uh, by the Bank of France and hampered by the fact that the country's military elite viewed its civilian leadership with utter contempt, a posture not lost on the country's anti-democratic forces. All these simmering tensions kind of came to a head, uh, oddly enough, with the eruption of a financial scandal that inflamed animosity toward the government and led to large street protests in January of 1934, culminating in a frenzy peak of rioting on February 6th in the, on the streets of Paris when 40,000 rioters armed with improvised weapons fought with authorities in battles that left 17 dead and 2,000 wounded. The government in charge considered uh, imposing a state of siege, but thought that that might bring about the very end of the republic itself. And so they chose instead to resign, and a conservative-led government uh, was duly formed. Uh, academics debate the broader significance of the events of February 6th, uh, but as one study properly concludes, the riots, quote, unseated a government and reversed an electoral mandate, and, quote, demonstrated the strength and breadth of right-wing authoritarian nationalism in France. So the conservatives are in, um, but they still have the Great Depression on their hands. Uh, and with the applause and support of the Bank of France, they seek to impose even more uh, orthodox medicine. In late 1935, a government led by Pierre Laval tries a little something called super deflation, which featured across the board spending cuts, always and importantly to defense spending as well. Uh, it's important to observe that Laval would later spend two years leading the country's vassal Vichy government after the fall of France. And it is not coincidental that his mid thirties austerity measures went hand in hand with a foreign policy aimed at warmer relations with Nazi Germany. Nevertheless, Laval or not, for the balance of the decade, budgetary pressures and capital flight would be consequential. They would restrain defense spending and perhaps even more importantly, encourage timidity in moments of international financial, international political crisis, excuse me, such as uh, over the remilitarization of the Rhineland and also famously at Munich. Once again, as, as Mark has explained extensively, Super deflation was not really the way to cure France's economic woes, but it did indeed in, inflict enough general economic misery uh, that it brought about a change in government 
And so by 1936, the Popular Front, led by Leon Blum, was swept into office, giving France its first socialist prime minister. But importantly, this did not usher in a new period of stability. Rather, and again, the lesson is general, uh, the election of Blum, if anything, underscored rather than resolved the bitter and enduring tensions that gripped the country at this time. There's a terrifying moment during the campaign of 1936 in which then candidate Blum was dragged from his car and brutally beaten. A shocking photo of the bruised and bandaged soon to be prime minister held the cover of Time magazine uh, in a few weeks and it really stunned the world. And once Blum was actually in office, um, capital flight, of course, continually undermined his expansionist economic policies and his efforts at more robust rearmaments, as one study described, capital holders repeatedly put their own interests above those of the nation. Or there's a different way of putting this. They had a different perception of what the national interest was. The national interest can be contested. And if it is contested, then there will be different visions of how to best pursue that national interest. Again, uh, a lesson that resonates uh, in, into the present. And so in 1937, the famous phrase, better Hitler than Blum, was so common among the upper classes that one account says it became almost a chant. France hollowed out and virtually at war with itself was in little position and in many quarters only modestly disposed to resist the German onslaught. The failure of France in the 1930s and its subsequent collapse was not a failure of its material capabilities, although those capabilities were inhibited by the economic pressures of the decade, um, but it was in a word, or in a phrase, a civilizational failure. And then we're back to these questions of the domestic social economy and the domestic political setting. And what I wanna argue now leaping forward to the present is that it is not possible to assess American power or more narrowly our interest here, America's capability to practice and participate in acts of economic warfare and economic diplomacy without being attentive to the state uh, of American civilization. Well, let's start uh, with, with a dreary quote. Uh, it stands to reason and is borne out by historic experience that societies, like individuals, have a breaking point, Hans Morgenthau once warned. Nobody can say beforehand with precision, with, sorry, with precision what that point is. It is sufficient to know that it exists. A society can take so much and no more. Um, I have a glorious excursus here to my friend Thucydides talking about the collapse of Athenian democracy during the Peloponnesian War in the interest of time. I'm going to skip over that, but it's a heck of a story. And I wanna resume this discussion again by focusing on uh, the American experience and argue that it only makes sense for those of us interested in talking about economic warfare and economic statecraft, uh, to do so if the nation in question is capable of competently and pursuing such efforts in a capable and sustained way. And again, what I have been implying and what I will now say plainly is that for the US, it is conceivable that this is no longer the case. And again, this will transcend a purely materialist analysis. Um, any assessment uh, of material power will be, I argue, both incomplete and almost certainly, in the case of the US, misleading. Why? Because, because look at the US. It's got a resilient, sophisticated, colossal economy, a gargantuan military. It's got you know, capabilities coming out of its ears in, on paper. Uh, but that power, I would argue, is circumscribed by its current domestic, social, political disarray. And I think that the parallels uh, between the US now and France then are alarming. 
the U.S. is characterized by a radical polarization of its polity and almost as important by a widespread embrace of unreason. And that matters. These are factors which will undermine the coherence of any American purpose on the world stage uh, and its ability to ethically practice um, foreign policy more generally. All right. So how did we get here? What went wrong? I mean, it's a little strange because not very long before these domestic problems became too salient to ignore, uh, American global predominance seemed so incredible that, that people needed new words to even describe it, right? It was a hegemon superpower. No, no, no. It's, it, it, that doesn't even begin to tell you how powerful uh, the US is. And so in 1999, um, the economist invents the phrase, uh, or bandies about the phrase, uh, hyperpower. Um, the U.S. bestrides the globe like a colossus. Um, not long before, that leading IR theorists cogently argued, quote, the unprecedented concentration in power resources in the U.S. generally renders inoperative the constraining effects of the systemic properties long central to research in international relations. So, you know, at the turn of the century there, um, it's the hyperpower. Yet in retrospect, at the same time, America is already, if quietly, cultivating the conditions that would contribute to its domestic social desiccation. Thus, although in the two decades that have followed the generally shared assessment of the US as an unprecedented hyperpower, the measurable erosion of its relative material capabilities is relatively modest. Nevertheless, few people looking out the window in 2020 would describe American power by the only metric that matters, the ability to achieve its desired objectives in world politics with the same awestruck terms so commonly articulated at the turn of the last millennium. And again, why? Because even at the hyperpower moment, you can see uh, the problems present and brewing. Um, once again, uh, Sam Huntington, who is often quite uh, accurate at seeing uh, these types of developments, stated in that very same moment, in 1999, that a state in command of such immense power quote, is normally able to maintain its dominance over other states for a long time until it is weakened by internal decay or by forces from outside the system entirely, uh, both of which happened, he says, to 5th century Rome and 19th century China, and I would add to that list uh, 4th century BCE Athens, which was destroyed not from without, but from within. Um, and as often the case only in retrospect, we can see that America's internal decay was already well underway at that very moment when commentators were genuflecting before the vaunted hyperpower. Aggregate US growth in the 1990s was impressive, but compared to other good decades of the American economic experience, such as the 1960s, those gains were less evenly distributed and skewed toward the already wealthy, a trend that would only continue in the following years. The story of the American experience of the last several decades is the story of the rich getting much, much richer while median household incomes stagnated. Part of this is attributable to changes in the philosophical underpinnings and from there, in turn, the structure of the American domestic economy, something obviously I can talk about uh, endlessly, but we can reserve that discussion more generally uh, for Q&A. But we should make the observation that in broad brush, the American political economy shifted from one associated with what John Ruggie coined, associated with the compromise of embedded liberalism and economic policies that we can associate with Keynes towards a more ruthless Darwinian commitment to quote unquote shareholder value. America became an increasingly financialized economy and an increasingly winner-take-all society with those already 
well placed and well advantaged in the best position to win. An important part of this can be attributed to hubris. Again, we can get into that more in Q&A, but it was manifest at the height of American power and reflected in the great financial deregulation project, which generated enormous amounts of wealth for some, but also caused the uh, spread of systemic risk throughout the, the American and global financial system. And so what happens, you know, we know what happens, which is in the second decade of the 21st century, the price for all this hubris comes, comes uh, due uh, in the form of failed wars and more to the point here, uh, the global financial crisis. But in terms of the social economy, in terms of domestic politics, the larger question is, to whom were those bills presented, right? All right, we saved the financial system. And we had to save the financial system. I have no complaints about saving the financial system. I complain about uh, letting the bankers off the hook, but we had to save the financial system. On the other hand, mainstream America, which had already borne the disproportionate cost of America's ongoing wars, which was already under stress from international competition, from the forces of globalization, and from the embrace of Dickensian shareholder value capitalism at home, they were served austerity and the Great Recession. Not to be underestimated is that coterminous with these pressures was the rise of the internet and social media culture, which I will say with British understatement, did not bring about the best in American society. Uh, America, we should recall, is a society once characterized by what Richard Hofstadter once called a paranoid style of politics, wherein resentments against a hostile and conspiratorial world are directed against a culture, a way of life, and which elicit political passions fueled by a sense of righteousness and moral indignation. Structure matters, and right now we're living in a structure defined by a hypermedia environment characterized by low costs of entry, incentives for attention getting extremist posturing, limited accountability, and the relentless subversion of truth claims. Such an environment could not be more well designed to reinforce the twin pathologies of contemporary America, which is the radical polarization and Hofstadter's paranoid style to an even greater extent. And so, as we all know, we see the bitter harvest of this come home in 2016. But I think it is a mistake to focus uh, on the general election of 2016 and, and see that as the symptom of the disarray of the American domestic social polity. Really, the story that's taking place where you want to see the change in America takes place in the nominating process, where fringe outsiders take over or almost take over established political parties. If you look at the Democratic uh, nominating process, what would have normally been a protest candidate, right, an old man socialist from a tiny state who wasn't even a member of the party, uh, came very, very close to uh, uh, defeating one of the most powerful political machines in contemporary American history. And this was a function of kind of brewing and widespread anger throughout the country and revulsion indeed at governing elites festering during these decades of middle class de uh, difficulties that I've been talking about. In the Republican primaries, again, the story I think is more interesting uh, or more analytically interesting, that is, than the outcome of the general election, in which a vulgar, inexperienced game show host just blows away a broad field of establishment competitors. Despite his own intermittent party membership, almost no fixed political principles, although the few political principles he had were actually antithetical to what the party had stood for for three decades. And he just steamrolls through a pretty impressive slate by the standards of the party of candidates. And, and why I want to dwell on that is because 
one can look at the outcome of the general election of 2016 and talk about the significance of the culture wars or talk about an aversion by some to the Democratic candidate. Uh, those factors are not there uh, in the Republican nominating process. So what we have here, again, I think is something that was brewing for many decades that was exacerbated by the experiences uh, of the first decade of the 21st century that come to full flower in its second decade. As Adam Tooze very smartly put it, 2016 was more about 2008 than 2012 was. And we, if we look at it in this way, I think we can see that the election of 2020, the most recent American election, actually doesn't change these stark underlying realities. In fact, in some ways, it reinforces those underlying realities, in particular by brightly illuminating the fundamental transformation of the Republican Party into something very different, and especially something very different as it uh, engages the rest of the world. And also, uh, it sheds further light on a basic division within the Democratic Party itself that, again, will have basic foreign policy consequences. So, in conclusion, it may or may not be following uh, Hans Morgenthau that American society has reached its breaking point. But what I wanted to bring to the table here for our ongoing discussion of economic warfare and economic statecraft, both in the past, but especially in the present, is that we really shouldn't be talking about the prospects for economic warfare and economic statecraft, especially with regard to the contemporary United States, without reckoning with the prospect that there may be considerable limits to the ability of the US separate from its material capabilities to actually pursue such measures productively. And I will stop there and hopefully we'll have an engaging q and I can't imagine a world in which a talk like that would not provoke an engaging Q&A. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So a reminder to everyone who's participating uh, in-house uh, to put your questions in the Q&A. We've got a few up already. And uh, for everyone who's on YouTube, we are watching the screen. Put your questions in the comments or grabbing them and they will appear on the chat. So I'm going to begin the relay now. The first two that came out were from Kathleen Burke and from Patrick Chauvinek. And they're related, so I'm going to run them together. So um, Kathleen puts it very succinctly, inequality didn't prevent British mobilization between 2010 and 2018. Why was this? And uh, Patrick pushed it in a broader perspective, so you can address all of it, I'm sure. You raise the issue of income inequality undermining the cohesion necessary to sustain foreign policy goals. How do you think this applies to earlier periods of high income inequality and social stress in the US, the 1890s, the 1920s, and leading into World War I and World War II? So I think you can just address that whole thing for our kickoff. Uh, great. Uh, so these are excellent questions. Uh, let me begin by, uh, I, I don't see you on my screen, but uh, uh, saying hello, Professor Burke. I've read your work uh, for, for years, but I don't think we've ever properly met. So it's a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Um, the short answer to your question is, um, I think something I had hoped I had emphasized earlier in the talk, but maybe had not done so, adequately, which is I don't think we have clean off the shelf theories that will take us from income inequality towards foreign policy outcomes. And there are just so many reasons for that. Again, social norms about income inequality have a lot to do with that. Expectations about income inequality, uh, perceptions of fairness and perceptions of fairness are culturally bound. Um, this is something that Keynes wrote about even before uh, he became a Keynesian in the, in the, from 1919 to 1924. On several occasions, he talked about how capitalism could only be sustainable if everybody thought it was fair. So what people will tolerate as fair is more important than uh, the Gini coefficient. So I can't tell you anything about the Gini coefficient and its consequences of foreign policy behavior. But I would argue um, that if large swaths of a country increasingly come to view the system and the economic system under which they are operating as being unfair, that rigged against them to, to point a phrase, 
then that will lead to broader political problems. But I don't, I don't have any, I don't mean to make any claims or arguments about a straight line explanation between the level of economic inequality and any foreign policy outcome anywhere. And then the other question was about the 1890s, 1920s, et cetera. Well, essentially, no, that was, you, she was particularly concerned with the UK. Uh, and Patrick was talking about the US and basically have these other periods, the 1890s, the 1920s, which are also periods of high inequality. So, yeah, I mean, I think my, my reaction uh, would be similar. The 1890s are such an interesting period uh, in American history, especially for questions uh, of political economy. Uh, there, of course, there are so many overdetermining factors with the, the kind of emergence of the US as a great power at that time. But, you know, these political economy questions are extraordinarily rich and complex. And the, the, the rather nasty version of capitalism that was practiced uh, in the 1890s in particular uh, did yield many of the reforms of the progressive era in, in, the, in the decades that followed. And the 1920s in the US, I think, are interesting for being pregnant with the 1930s in a way that I think that the 1990s were pregnant with the aughts uh, of this century. Uh, but again, I do, I, do not, I do not wish to come across as claiming I can look at a country's income inequality and draw confident conclusions about its foreign policy disposition. Fair enough. I'm going to move to YouTube. We have a question from someone. Unfortunately, I don't know who put this in there, so I'm just going to read it out. Uh, to what extent are the ominous parallels between interwar France and the contemporary US blunted by the absence of a gold standard and or the latter's comparative geographical isolation? In other words, the analogy is stretched by the fact that it's a different world. So I do think, uh... And, and here, here I know you're with me, Mark. <laughs> that you know that the ab the absence of a commitment to trying to stay on the gold standard really takes the edge off of um, some of the intensity of austerity politics. Um, and if if I was going to be optimistic, uh, which is not you know which, which is not the side of the plate I swing from, uh, I would observe that the that finally now the U.S. seems to be likely to be embarking on an experiment of anti-austerity, a one that I think that is welcome. But for the argument that I want to make with regard to where the U.S. is at the moment, the, the resort to a version of austerity very shortly after the global financial crisis, I think is an important variable in this story. Um, we save the financial system with immediate emergency measures. But when we did that, um, that allowed the resumption of politics as usual, and immediately the guardians of, or of orthodoxy, the guardians of austerity, were able to kind of reassert their political influence and their political authority. And that contributed to the depths and difficulty of the Great Recession. And that is uh, you know, this has been written about, uh, I've written about this, but, you know, there was really good work on this. I think Barry Eichengreen's book, Hall of Mirrors, is quite good on this, talking about how in the Depression, the financial systems, it was an implosion so complete that you got good reforms. And so even though the Depression was worse, uh, the reforms afterwards were better. But whereas in the contemporary crisis, because the initial response was more competent, you didn't get the necessary reforms that would have made the system more sustainable. And similarly, Martin Wolf in his very fine book, The Shifts and the Shocks, uh, pointed out how what the saving of the financial system followed by the resort to orthodoxy afterwards reinforced among people, and again, this is ideational, a sense that well-connected insiders were subsidized and protected by the government and that the regular people on Main Street were left to eat their garbage uh, and, and not attended to. And it's that, so that, that, again, so it's not just inequality. It's a sense of economic justice, a sense of 
the system and you know this idea that this idea that quote unquote the system is rigged uh, did not come from nowhere. Uh, you can gesture at events and governance uh, that left people with this impression. And part of it, um, you know, roots to the centrist lurch of the Democratic Party in the 1990s, which is what you can't completely blame them for. They got their butts kicked in four out of five elections. And so, you know, coming up with a new electoral strategy wasn't a shocking choice, but it did cause a convergence uh, in both political parties towards a certain type of politics, towards an embrace of Wall Street, towards a certain practice of capitalism that further exacerbated both inequality in the US and just as importantly, this sense that well-connected wealthy insiders had access to government protection and everybody else was just left to their own devices. So an impression, um, I actually call it a class specific put option, but that's just my way of thinking about it. All right, so I'm gonna group two of them together, uh, Stephen Broadbury and Avner Offer because they're both pushing on the same thing again. So here's the first one from Stephen. After a poor military performance during World War I, the French economy performed well during the 20s, but badly during the 30s. So is it fair to say that France's quick response in the 40s was due to political polarization rather than economic weakness? So first one. Second thing from Avner, not sure about the analogy, France's failure was ultimately military, not economic. There was no lack of will in the USA to conduct economic warfare. On the contrary, it has broken precedents in its mercantilist conflict with China, which enjoys broad partisan support. America's weakness lies in its inability to impose military power, for example, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Power requires boots on the ground. You cannot pay soldiers enough to get them killed for their country. They will make the sacrifice for non-material incentives, but probably not to maintain imperial power. So two things then, is it really the economic and the freeing of the social contract? Is it not just simply they were kind of crap? And then the other one is that the Americans, it's not, if, if you're talking about weakness, yes, weakness for books on the ground, certainly, but not for economic stuff, because we can do that digitally. We don't need to worry about the social fabric to do that stuff. Your thoughts? These are two very important questions, but they're very distinct. So I'm going to do France first, and then I may have to be retold the uh, U.S. question if I get it wrong in, in my answer. So let me let me just say this. Um, this is a, a active debate uh, among military historians, right? Was uh, was the German victory uh, a kind of a fluke? Um, or, uh, you know, what, what was the puzzle? Is, is, is it a puzzle to be explained or was it predetermined? I don't think, I mean, I, I don't have a dog in that particular fight. I do think that the decade of the 30s um, was characterized not simply by the misguided fetish for orthodoxy, which damaged the French military establishment. Defense spending was routinely cut. Um, uh, Barry Posen in his book on British and French interwar grand strategy uh, comes to the conclusion that both sides made some odd choices, but at least the British chose to self-insure, whereas the French did not. And he said that this is probably attributable to domestic factors that he is not addressing in his book. But I think and that's fair if the, you know, Barry can do that, and that's fair, he's not addressing those domestic factors. But I do think you can't just look at the economic problems of France in the 1930s. You really do need to look at this radical political polarization of French society. I would argue the counterfactual case that if there was no Germany, uh, France would have been on the cusp of a civil war. It was a country that divided and that all foreign policy questions, not surprisingly, were seen through the lens of that rabid, domestic political confrontation. And that even if the military defeat on the battlefield, which I do think um, was a little easier than it should have been, uh, the manifestation of the illness of French society, and I don't hesitate to call it an ill society at that time, is really more plainly visible in the docility uh, of the occupation and submission and the ease with which uh, so many in France were 
content and at times eager uh, to participate uh, in the, the German agenda. Uh, it's, it's disgraceful and shameful and horrifying. And I think the history there uh, is, is frightening uh, for us all because uh, basically I'm a political realist. And so I, I don't think we are necessarily better than them. Uh, people today are not better, faster, stronger, brighter, or, or more decent humans than those of the 1930s. And so if that could happen to a society that in the 1920s was considered kind of the apogee of human civilization, then certainly it can happen anywhere. Uh, I fear I've rambled away from your question a little bit. Well, you got, the, you got the first part, but let's turn to Avner, which is essentially, yeah, but hold on, if we're talking about economic warfare, you, or you can be right about all that. It makes economic warfare more likely because boots on the ground is actually hard to do. Sure, and that's great. Uh, and on economic warfare, I would, I would just want to make two um, qualifications. One is the, is the kind of simple tactical one. And it's not part of my, it wasn't the thrust of my presentation, but it's something we're going to want to be talking about in the subsequent sessions, which is tactical blunders can be consequential. I mean, the, the, the French economic warfare actually contributed to the global financial 1931, which had many causes, of course. And during the crisis, it made it worse. And the result of all that was to undermine French power. So that, that's a sidebar. I just want to, I'm looking, looking forward to talking about that when we talk about the practice of economic warfare, the unintended consequences and the blowback of it. I think that's going to be a lot of fun for our subsequent discussions. The more narrow question is, okay, so the U.S. can't do boots on the ground anymore, um, but it can still do economic warfare. Um, the answer is sure, as long as it doesn't impose costs. Any economic warf, any economic measures that nobody notices, on, you know, in America, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, smoke them if you got them. The, the U.S. will not be inhibited from practicing costless economic warfare. My argument is that the U.S. will be inhibited from practicing economic warfare and economic statecraft that then is perceived to have real costs on real people within the United States, and that is because I think the domestic wherewithal within the country to make sacrifices in the name of some broadly articulated quote unquote national interest is extremely thin. And I think it's extremely thin because I think that the visions of the national interests are contested. So there are very different visions of them. So people won't be willing to make sacrifices for in the name of foreign policy measures designed to advance a national interest they disagree with, but also the nerves are so frayed that the willingness of those who feel they've been screwed for 40 years to bear the costs of any foreign policies, I think, are, are quite less than they have been at most other points in modern American history. Thank you. So I'm going to pull on a couple of other ones now. They're heading in different directions. I'm going to pull in Maria Grinberg just now. Security literature suggests that war and specifically defense of the homeland provides a unifying effect for the population of a nation. If France had had more time for self-defense, could this have overwhelmed the domestic polarization effect? And also you might want to talk on here, there is something that's very different about France vis-a-vis -vis the US, which was the domestic role of the Communist Party and Therese. There's no equivalent to that in the US case. You have comments on those? So, I don't think so. Uh, I don't, I don't, I think France was ready to roll over. I think it was ready to roll over because I think it was hollowed out. There's a very good book on France. I'm not, I don't, I don't have it. I don't speak French. I'm not an expert on France. I'm a, I'm a avid obsessive reader of the secondary literature, but this is not, you know, something that I'm relatively new to. Um, but I, I, there's a, you know, Books on uh, France in this period have titles like The Hollow Years. Um, and even uh, uh, books that want to push back against um, the argument that there was something wrong in French society. You read them and they still acknowledge this. What mm -hmm. they say is these horrible things were going on and France was a wreck and it had no vision and it was war with itself. Nevertheless, I do want to insist that it was really just the luck of the draw that caused them to, 
kind of to lose the Battle of the Frontiers in 1914. Um, that's that's debatable. I just don't. I there were a lot of actors in France, especially among actors that mattered, meaning military and economic and political elites on the right, uh, who feared war more than they feared defeat. Okay. You know, you talk about the communists, and so we should come, we can come back to the communists and, and then in the American context and all that. Um, but a lot of conservative actors in France very much perceived that France was on the cusp of a social upheaval that would transform the country in ways that would make it unrecognizable to the values that they held. And these were 19th century values, okay, no kidding around values. And so, and they were convinced, and this was true of some conservatives in Britain as well, uh, who were worried about the consequences of a war effort on the power of the labor movement in Britain, uh, because they thought that it would require compromises uh, with labor that they, that they didn't want, really want to make. And so, again, this is a much smaller extent in Britain than in France, but in France, there was such a fear that simply a war, win or lose, although they were, of course, traumatized by World War I, intimidated by Germany, and afraid of losing, a war, win or lose, would be a loss because the act of the war would cause the social changes in France that they wanted to avoid. And so I don't think if they had gotten luckier or fought better and held off um, the German onslaught for a little longer that the country would have rallied together. I think the country was ideologically uh, at war with itself and had such radically divergent visions. To the Americans today, uh, you know, we don't have communists, but but we may have Maoists. Uh, there, there's a there's a division on the American left, uh, largely along America uh, along generational lines, but not not entirely along generational lines. That is very distinct. Um, I would go so far. I don't think I'm just being provocative here. I, I think I feel this uh, in that there are elements of the of this younger left I'm talking about that are kind of illiberal and that this conflict within the left reflects an ideological division and an ideological threat that does frighten people on the right and is used instrumentally uh, by influencers on the right to rally actors uh, more generally. And so, yeah, we don't have communists, but we do have boogeymen. Uh, and I think the boogeymen that are appealed to are uh, the, the, that wing of the current left that is illiberal. Um, and so you do have these elements of fundamental social division. So there is a parallel between, a, a very distinct parallel, between France in the 20s and the U, France in the 30s and the US in the 20s, in that there are actors on both sides of the divide who think that their quote unquote way of life, their vision of what the country means to them, is in fact on the table in these debates uh, about public policy more generally. And like France in the, in, the, in the 1930s, therefore the conception of the national interest is very distinct and can lead to really wiggy choices. So France makes some foreign policy choices in the 1930s that look ridiculous from any analysts of foreign policy. But if you break it down and look at the motivations of the actors within the society who see internal dissension as more important than external threat, then they kind of at least have an internal coherent logic to them. But I do want to agree with my, your initial point, which is, what I'm saying would not apply to economic warfare that does not seem to present visible costs on particular people within the societies who could then squawk. This requires squawking for it to matter. Well, lots of questions. I mean, I'm going to have to abbreviate you as much as I enjoy it. So I'm going to put Colin Jackson and Peter Dombrowski together, and this is about long-term trends versus shocks. And then also I'm going to put this on a kind of change of system question. So here's the whole thing together. 
So how much weight should we give to episodes and shocks, the 2007 crisis, the 2003 war, COVID, versus long-term trends in the US case? If we do the counterfactual and you knock those things out, right, is it just, first of all, could you have the rise in inequality and the stagnation in incomes and the fracturing of the social fabric, right? So is it shocks, to, is it shifts and shocks, if you want to put it in, in Wolf's terms, right? And then Peter comes in with a, a, another one, which I think it builds on top of this. Can oligopolistic capitalisms populated by large transnational corporations be enlisted in any meaningful sense in economic warfare? The motivations and interests of the Googles and Amazons and so forth are mixed, and efforts to control and listen channel by the US pace to PRC have been less than successful. I'd push that even further. Have we got to not just a polarized society, but a kind of globalized capitalism, right? And channeling, you know, I, a normal a Norman Angel version 2.0 that really kind of raises the costs of any type of belligerent strategy. So we might be confusing fracture and timidity for the problems of complexity, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, let me briefly take on the second question first. And I'm going to do it briefly uh, because I think that's what we're going to be talking about for three weeks. And most of you guys know more about those issues than I do. Uh, but I do want to put my political realist hat back on and just observe that whatever disincentives, economic disincentives there are uh, for international conflict, uh, countries seem to find a way to still do stupid things. And so I would not put, I would take some, I mean, incentives matter. Uh, the, greater the, incentive, the greater the disincentives for war there are, the less likely war is, all other things held constant. But of course, all other things aren't held constant and actors uh, often do things that are not obviously in their material interests, especially in the context of crises that spiral out of control. Um, but I do think that the panoply of issues raised in that second question um, are more for the group over the next few weeks then they speak to kind of what I can speak to with confidence. As for the first question, I would simply make um, two observations. COVID is exogenous. Um, the wars and the global financial crisis were endogenous to American hyperpower and hubris, not exogenous. And I think that part of that had to do with something I said I could talk about forever, I won't. Uh, but that I think is very important here, and that is the shift in the ideological foundations and the practice of American capitalism from a kind of Keynesian inflected embedded liberal order to a kind of shareholder value winner take all society. And that that latter shift is one of the things, one of the things that poison the well of American politics. Uh, speaking of poisoning the well, something that you've written on before, this is from Philip Juan. Um, how do you disaggregate the domestic political division in American domestic politics due to income inequality versus the alternative fact of being shifting ethnic and racial demographics, which are occurring at the same time? It's always just good to get your, your, your view on this one, Jonathan, while it's out there. Sure. Um, that's a great question. Um, it is not possible to talk about American politics uh, without reckoning with race. That has almost always been true. Uh, that is more true now as, as identity politics has been mobilizing on all aspects of American society. Um, it is certainly empirically demonstrable that uh, white anxiety uh, about transformations that are taking place in America, that it will in a couple of decades become a majority minority uh, country. Um, are, the significance of these and explaining outcomes in American politics uh, can't be uh, you know, overstated. Uh, they're, they're real, they're profound, they matter. And of course, they're in many ways uh, deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, and again, there's a long history of, of racial politics in America that manifests itself in lots and lots of horrifying ways, but we are in a moment in which I think they are particularly salient and consequential. 
Um, that said, you know, as an IR political economy guy, I do tend to focus my own analyses of these situations more through the lens of economic justice than of racial politics, uh, simply because that's where my own, you know, command of the under uh, of the situation is more likely to lie. So I don't, I, I don't mean to minimize the crucial racial element of the contemporary American political crisis. Uh, but for what I have to say, there's not a lot more I can do than acknowledge it and be attentive to its importance in the context of what I've been arguing. I would, I would claim that if we were doing a much better job on the political economy side domestically, that it might be helpful in taking the edge off of some of these uh, heavily racialized political confrontations. Fair enough. Um, I'm going to pull one off of the chat here. This is from James Barrels. Uh, are boots on the ground as important as ships in the sea? And how does the Belt and Road Project impact the aspects of economic warfare as an effective method of foreign policy? If I may unpack that a little bit, uh, why are we looking so much at economic warfare when the new frontier might be through things like foreign and foreign direct investment as manifest by the Belt and Road? Any thoughts on that? Yes, um, I have two thoughts. One, I want to get, I want to, I want to just flag and set aside, which is, we never ever want to get away from um, the military side of these things. I don't personally. And I do think that we, when we're doing that, we never, ever, ever want to get away from the fact that there is often a vast gap between having the ability to impressively exercise military power and the ability to achieve the goals for which the military power was introduced. Okay, so we always want to be alert to that and we always want to do that. On the other uh, question, uh, dude, uh, that's economic warfare for me. I mean, I'm, I'm heavily invested in uh, Hirschman effects. Um, and so economic, you know, economic relation, maybe warfare is a rough word, you know, or, or a or a overly sharp word to use in that, but economic relations have political consequences. And if we want to talk about economic statecraft, maybe it's not economic warfare, but we do need to be very alert uh, to these, these phenomena. Now, the Belt and Road and its consequences, our China people can chime in on that, and it's contested and complex, but it is not irrelevant that South Korea's largest export market is China. Uh, this didn't used to be the case. It is the case now. Can, uh, and from a Hirschman-esque perspective, this must have political consequences. Not necessarily coercive political consequences, but simply in the ways in which the South Korean policy looks out the window and makes its own assessment of its political objectives in the world and how it should be positioning itself. And I don't think any discussion over the next few weeks of political statecraft, I mean, maybe not political warfare, but political statecraft uh, would be complete without being attentive to the ways in which economic relations shape political relations. And if you, you know, you, you can bring this all the way back to the Marshall Plan, which was on the one hand, a tremendous act of, you know, economic farsightedness and generosity and blah, 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 but it also contributed to a transformation of the economic orientation of many Western European countries in a way that nested them in a certain type of international economic system that had benefits for America's international political vision. And so, you know, if the Belt and Road is as hoo-ha important as its most dramatic advocates say it is, and again, this is fraught and contested, then political consequences from that will surely follow. So we have time for probably one more. So I'm going to put the last two that we haven't addressed together. One of them we've touched on slightly before. This is from Professor BD. I've been trying to guess from the attendant list who that is. I'm sure I know you, but I can't think as to who this is. Anyway, um, to simplify the question, to put this all in a contemporary context, when will US-based businesses embrace the idea that economic interactions are a national security concerns? Of course, mass preferences matter a lot, but the increased regulation of transnational commercial activities 
are likely to be less salient to mass publics, extrapolating QED more salient to them. You did appeasing the bankers. What about appeasing the global manufacturers? So put that one there, right? Now, finally, from Tyler Jost, can you talk a bit more about contemporary episodes in which the US failed to achieve foreign policy objectives because of political polarization? I'm thinking Vietnam. Is the argument more about general trends or the one or two more episodes you think really illustrate the argument? So is it just France or are there other ones? And then basically, can you appease business or do you need to? So on the, the, the businesses first, um, when will they come to view uh, this as more than just business, but as also politics? Yes, uh, I guess. Uh, never. Um, well, um, so there's a really good book on this in the 80s by Jerry Cohn called In Whose Interests? Uh, and it was about uh, the American financial community and their role in um, foreign policy. And businesses just don't, I mean, I'm not a business studies scholar, but they just don't think of themselves in that way. They think of themselves as being in the business of business. And perhaps there's a collective action problem here where they understand that it all matters in some way writ large, but they have shareholders and bottom lines and jobs to keep, and they, they, will, they will deal with anyone at any time. I mean, let me give you a dramatic example. You know, the Warner Brothers, uh, uh, the, the Brothers Warner, who were Jewish refugees, uh, you know, cut deals to have their films shown in Nazi Germany uh, in censored versions, right? Because the, it's, you know, it's not a pretty story, but I would not look to our, our or anyone else's businesses as to be the kind of paladins of our foreign policy apparatus. Uh, I think that they are, they behave as caricatured, uh, which is in the relentless search uh, for profit and the bottom line. On the second question, I do not think um, actually that the political polarization in the US that I have been describing uh, is responsible for the failure of the US to achieve its objectives in its recent wars. I do think that the conduct of those wars and the, where the burdens of those wars have fallen have contributed to the polarization in American society that I'm talking about. My concern about American power is more abstract, which is that looking forward now into the future, that it may not be capable of pursuing a foreign policy in its enlightened self-interest. That is one that will make short-term sacrifices for long-term gains, something that uh, Arnold Wolfer is called milieu goals, that it will increasingly look um, more short-sighted, transactionalist, and you know, to, to use a very ugly and historically fraught phase associated with that kind of vision of quote unquote America first, uh, you know, which the neo-Nazi Charles Lindbergh was a big fan of. Um, but again, I don't think I don't think polarization causes us to lose wars. I do think polarization will undermine our ability to pursue optimal and especially costly in the short term foreign policies that a dispassionate observer would nevertheless see as in the basic American interest to pursue. And of course, I just got, thank you, I just got a message from, this is of course, Sarah Borel Dansman who put that into the chat. She has to have her, um, her thing set up that way for her students. And of course, I was too dense to guess who it was. Sorry about that, Sarah, I do apologize. Uh, I need a chapter in Versailles on the story about the uh, film studio, about what about um, selling stuff to the Nazis for reasons I will talk to you later. Sure, but Warner Brothers, good books on Warner Brothers. It's tragic stuff. Right, I, I need to know this for reasons I will not bore everyone else with. Um, I think we have reached the end of our time. I think it's been an excellent setup, really got me thinking about these issues. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone again in two weeks. So uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. And thank you to everyone who participated either in-house or on YouTube. We had, I think, nearly 100 people watching on YouTube. So that's great. So um, congratulations to you, Jonathan, for such an excellent 120, in fact. There you are. You're, you're busting through your own attendance records. That's fabulous.
Uh, uh, thank you very much to everyone, and we'll see you all shortly. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for having me. It was a real pleasure.